Well, we're continuing back in 1 Timothy. Now, last time we were in 1 Timothy, we had looked at the qualifications for elders. Now, today we're going to be looking at the qualifications for deacons. And I want to give you a word of encouragement as we start. Perhaps some of you are sitting here and you're thinking, well, I'm not going to be a deacon or an elder. I really don't need to know this. Bear with me. Today, as we look at the qualifications of deacons and as we've looked at the qualifications for elders, these are important passages because they really help us, I think, understand the way Christ has ordained the organization of his church. So today we're going to be looking at the importance of deacons and how they really are essential for the church in order that the church meets the needs of the saints as all of the saints are called by God to serve one another. And I also pray that at the end of this message, we would all have a greater appreciation for, for what our fine deacons do for us here at Gospel of Grace Fellowship. So with that, let me get started straight away. We're going to be looking at the qualifications here right off the bat in verses 8 through 10. Listen to what Paul says. He says, deacons likewise. And I'm going to stop there for just a moment. Deacons likewise. Remember, he had just talked about the criteria for the elder. And what you're going to see is there's a lot of overlap between the criteria or qualifications for elder and that for the deacon. The only big distinction is that the elder must be apt to teach. And as we look at these qualifications, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. Isn't that really a qualification that every Christian should have if they're a Christian? Yes. And so whether it's elder qualifications or deacon qualifications, these are qualifications that are befitting every believer. And so really what Paul is saying is that elders and deacons should be exemplary believers. That's what he's saying. Deacons, likewise, he says, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Now, the first criteria Paul gives here is that they must be men of of dignity. The term dignity, semnos, I think is fairly synonymous with the being above reproach that we saw as a criteria for elders back in 1 Timothy 3 2. It is synonymous with the deacon being beyond reproach here on this screen at the end of verse 10. A deacon must be dignified in both his doctrine and his deeds as he does that which is pleasing to Christ. Notice an interesting one. He must be not one who's double tongue. I like that. That's a good rendering. De logos literally means a split word or a double word. Okay, so a deacon must be one who doesn't say one thing to one person and something else to another. Or a deacon can't be the man who says one thing and does something else. There has to be an integrity to this deacon. They must not be duplicitous. Notice also it says they must not be addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain. Let me hit this idea of being addicted to wine. Remember, in the scriptures, drinking alcohol in and of itself is not prohibited. And I say that because oftentimes you'll hear Christians say, well, Jesus never drank alcohol, and they'll go to great lengths to try to prove that the beverages that were labeled wine in the New Testament weren't alcoholic. That's nonsense. They were. Okay, so what's prohibited in the New Testament is not drinking any alcohol, but drinking in excess. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled by the Spirit. Notice Paul doesn't say, don't drink wine. In fact, later, sorry, I just stepped on my cord here. Later in 1 Timothy 5, Paul will tell Timothy to take some wine for the sake of his own stomach. Okay, so it's always drinking in excess that is the issue. One other caveat I also want to make is, remember, all of the qualifications for both the elder and the deacon are in the present tense. And I think the significance of that, it means that this is what characterizes a man. Okay, So let's say you had someone who had a drinking problem 20 years ago, or whatever time period, but they've overcome it. And people will say, well, no, we can't have it. Well, I would say if they're characterized by being sober or being one who limits himself in their drinking, that is what characterizes the man. That's how we should understand these things. Now, the other thing is, notice it says they're not to be fond of sordid gain. Again, the deacon is not to be greedy. I pointed out last time the elder had the same criteria. The elder must be one who wants to feed the flock, not fleece the flock. 
Well, in the same way, the deacon must be one who wants to serve the flock, not steal from the flock. Notice how I switched from F to uh, S there. So that's the idea with the deacon. Now, notice also in verse 9, I highlighted this red because it's very important. This is the same thing we see for elders. They must be, these deacons, those who hold to the mystery of the faith. Very succinctly, that simply means that a deacon must hold to the doctrines of the faith. The doctrines are revealed through Christ and his apostles. That's what it means. Now, why does Paul refer to it as the mystery of the faith? Well, remember for Paul... A mystery is something that was formerly concealed, but is now revealed through the apostles and prophets. Bob has been teaching us that very thing in Ephesians chapter 3. The reason I labor that point is some people will take that mystery of the faith, and they'll say, aha, Christianity is a mystical religion. We go sit in the corner, contemplate our navel, and we come up with all sorts of revelations. That's not what Paul intends. He's talking about the doctrines that have been revealed through the apostles and prophets. So an elder, or excuse me, a deacon must be one who holds on to them. Notice also he adds at verse 9 that he must hold to them with a clear conscience. Conscience for Paul is that inward referee within us that determines whether or not we're doing right or wrong. But for the apostle Paul, that conscience for a Christian must be informed by the norm of Scripture. So holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience means that a deacon's actions are not in variance with the teachings of Christ. They have to act out what they claim to believe. If they don't, they won't be having a clear conscience. That's the idea. Now, in verse 10, notice it says, These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons. That term tested, it's an interesting one. It comes from doki matso. We ran into that same term in Romans. Remember in Romans 1, you have the unregenerate. They dokimatso God, they test him, and they don't like him. In response, God hands them over to a depraved mind. Well, here the idea is that deacons must be tested to see if they're really genuine. The one issue that we have to wrestle with is, well, how much time does this take? Notice Paul does not say. This is an area of Christian liberty. But one thing I want to mention, I want you to think as Paul preaches the gospel, as he's an apostle, as he's planting churches throughout the Roman world, there wasn't often a lot of time for deacons or elders, for that matter, to be tested. So from that, I think you can garner that it perhaps is a short period of time. But we're never told. That's an area of Christian liberty. Finally, at the end, notice... Those who are tested, they'll show themselves to be beyond reproach. That's the overarching idea for both the elder and the deacon. And the idea is being beyond reproach means that even if an allegation were launched against them, them, it would be undoubtedly not true. Why? Because they live beyond reproach. That's the idea. Now, as we turn to these next verses here, we're going to ask the question and answer it, can women be deacons? That's what we see here actually in verse 11 of 1 Timothy 3. Paul says, Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Now, notice on the screen in the box, the big debate in this passage surrounds women. And that is because some commentators will claim that the women here are wives of deacons, and others would claim that these are women who are themselves deacons. I fall into the latter camp, and I'll be laying some evidence out for you in just a moment. But notice here what these women must be. They also must be dignified. The same term semnos was used for men. Again, a woman deacon must be one who is dignified in both doctrine and deeds, what they believe and how they act. Notice added to that is there not to be malicious gossips. That's an interesting term. It comes from diabolos. Diabolos is the term that we get for devil. The devil derives from diabolos. So remember the devil is a slanderer. So literally you could render this that they're not to be slanderers. However, I think the NESB is right to point out malicious gossips. Okay. Now, what's interesting is that's not used for men who are deacons. So why does Paul use this for women? Well, Paul uses de logos for men who are deacons, that we must not be double-tongued, say one thing, do another. 
Why? Perhaps men are more prone to that. But women, perhaps, are more prone to being gossips. Okay? Now, this doesn't mean it's okay for us male deacons, if you're in here, that you can gossip away, or it's okay for women deacons to be double-tongued. The idea is, I think Paul is hitting on little vices that each sex is more prone to. That's probably what he's getting at. By the way, when it comes to gossip, and again, I do think that that's an appropriate rendering of Diabolos here, a couple of tips that we see in the scripture so that you can avoid gossip. One is if you ever have an issue with another Christian, go to them in private. That's what we see in Matthew 18. Remember Matthew 18, Jesus says if someone sins, go to your brother or your sister is implied. Okay, so go to the person. Second, remember, you and I never know fully what's the, in the heart of another believer. In fact, Paul says that very thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, where he says, I don't even know my own heart. Remember Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitfully wicked, and it's deceitful beyond all things. Who can understand it? Well, the implied answer is it's God alone. Only God knows the heart. So those two things, always go to the person if you have an issue, and don't ever presume to know the motivations of another brother or sister that helps keep away or keep us from engaging in gossip notice also the woman deacon must be temperate faithful in all things temperate means they have to be sober in judgment so a woman deacon cannot be one who is irrational but one who is sober and sound in their thinking faithful in all things would again go back to the idea of both in doctrine and deeds the female deacon is called to be one who lives out according their, their lives, according to the doctrines of the faith. Now, let me get to the big issue here. Can women be deacons? Good Christians and good scholars have disagreed on this. So if someone holds to a different position, I'm not saying it's because they're some rabid heretic, but also I would like to be afforded the same, the same courtesy. I want to wrestle with this text and say, well, look, is this text referring to women who are deacons or women who are wives of the deacons? Well, first of all, let me cite to you some evidence from the other side. There's a wonderful scholar named George Knight III. He writes a great commentary on First and Second Timothy. And I learned from him. I will continue to learn from him. But we disagree here. But he gives three reasons why he believes these are wives of deacons. Let me just list them so you understand the rationale. Number one, he would claim the term woman that you see in the box, gune, Yes, it's often rendered women, but it also can be rendered wives. And it it is oftentimes in the New Testament. What determines whether we render it women or, or wives? Well, context. Okay, but he cites that as evidence that, yes, he thinks these are wives of deacons. The second point that he would make, and I'm just reading kind of from him, he says, no marital status is demanded of these women, whereas it is in every other ministry criteria for men. So, Men are never given the criteria, or excuse me, men are given the criteria that they have to be one-woman men, right, for both elders and deacons, but you don't see that for women. So for him, that's evidence that these are the wives of the deacons. A knight also claims that the wives are singled out here and given criteria and qualifications because they are so often working closely with their husband. Now, to me, I think that that's special pleading. I don't think we see that uh, distinguished in the scripture. So I think that that's just nice. So let me, with that, give you four reasons why I think women here can be deacons. Number one, if Paul had intended to say that these are wives of deacons rather than being deacons themselves, Paul could have said that differently in the Greek text. He could have used a genitive construction that said that these are women of the deacons. He could have used that construction, but he does not. He also could have used a possessive pronoun like he does in 1 Corinthians 7 2. I won't read the whole thing, but notice it says each man is to have his own wife. Notice the own, the possessive pronoun, that could have been used by Paul if Paul had intended in 1 Timothy 3 11 to say that these are wives of the deacon. But he doesn't use that. And I think the ambiguity is there because, yes, these are wives who are, or excuse me, women who are indeed deacons themselves. The second reason why I think these are women who are deacons is let's ask ourselves the questions, why would deacons have a different criteria for their wives or a criteria for their wives when elders do not? When you and I read about the criteria for elders in 1 Timothy 3, was there criteria given for their wives? 
No. Well, why is there criteria needed for the wives of deacons, but not of elders? To me, that doesn't seem to make any sense. A third reason why I think we can know that women can be deacons is because Paul, in Romans 16.1, calls Phoebe a deacon. Let's look at that passage. As I put up Romans 16.1, I want you to realize that there is some debate about this text, but I think it's more straightforward than most will acknowledge. Paul says here, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Chentre. Now notice the term servant in the red. That is the term diakonos. Now what's interesting about diakonos, that's the term for deacon that we saw in 1 Timothy 3. So he is certainly calling her a deacon. Now some will say that this is just a generic servant. And that's why the NESB renders it this way. However, think about this. The term diakonos itself is masculine. Typically, if you have Phoebe, who's feminine, you should have a masculine, either adjective or noun. But it's, excuse me, you'd have a feminine adjective or noun. But this is masculine. Why? Because that was the only choice Paul had. There wasn't a feminine form of diakonos. Now, the reason I cite that is that's further evidence that Paul was constrained because he wanted to say she was a deacon. He uses diakonos, the masculine form, because she really held to that position. That's, now, let me give you another point here that I think proves that here Phoebe is a deacon. To me, it doesn't make much sense for Paul to simply say that she's a generic servant of the church at Chentre. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're at a trade group And you're going to have someone from General Motors come and speak. Are they going to introduce that speaker as a worker from General Motors? A generic worker? No, they're going to say, well, this is the vice president of operations from General Motors. They'll give the title. In the same way, I think that's exactly what Paul is doing. Why? Because he's commending her to the church in Rome. That's why he's using her title. What's more... If Paul was saying simply that Phoebe was a servant and not a deacon, he could have said that other ways as well. For example, in Colossians 1.7, Epaphras is called a fellow servant, sundulos. Paul could have used that, or he could have called her a fellow worker. He could have called her a fellow servant, a fellow worker, but he doesn't. He uses diakonos. Why? Because Phoebe was a deacon. Now, the final reason to me is the coup de grace as to why women can be deacons. Let's remind ourselves, what is the prohibition that women have in the church? Well, let's turn our Bibles and look at it afresh. Turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. 1 Timothy 2, 12. Please turn your Bibles there. 1 Timothy 2, 12. Notice Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. So what is prohibited for a woman in the church? She can't teach or exercise authority. And more than likely, those go hand in hand. Now, a deacon does neither. Inherent to the deacon role is the idea of service, but it's not teaching or exercising authority. Now, as I say that, there may be men who are deacons who teach in any given church, but the teaching isn't because of them being a deacon, but it's because they're also a teacher. In other words, the teaching role is inherent, is not inherent to the deacon role itself. So let's ask ourselves the question, why would Paul prohibit women from being deacons if, in fact, they're only prohibited from teaching and exercising authority. If Paul was going to prohibit women from being deacons, he would have had to add to 1 Timothy 2.12 to say, I do not permit a woman to teach, exercise authority, or to serve in the church. Because that's precisely what the deacon role is, to serve. But he never says that. Dear ones, to me it makes no sense that a woman would be prohibited from serving. They're prohibited from being an elder, They're prohibited from being a teacher in the church over men and exercising authority. But that is not what the deacon position entails. So I think clearly women can be deacons. I think that's Paul's point in 1 Timothy 3.11. Okay, now, with that, let's get back to the qualifications here in verses 12 through 13. And by the way, 
On your handout, there's a typo. I had sent out my PowerPoint to be a handout before I caught it. And notice it says qualifications for elder on your sheet. It should be qualifications for deacons. I usually copy and paste into my previous PowerPoint. I just forgot to change the title. So cross that out and put qualifications for deacons, if you will. What you see on the screen is correct. Paul says deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now, notice here the deacon is to be literally in the red. It's a one-woman man. Okay, one-woman man. There have to be one who has only one spouse. That's the idea. Now, the question here often comes, people, I've seen this throughout my time as being a pastor. You'll mention someone as a candidate, and someone will say, oh, I know so-and-so, but they had a divorce 30 years ago. Remember, the present tense nature of the verses means this is what characterizes the man. So let's take a man who was divorced 30 years ago, but for 30 years he's been faithful to one woman. That's a one-woman man. That's how I would understand this text. Now, notice not only are they to be a one-woman man, but they're to be good managers of their children in their own household. Remember Paul said why that was necessary for the elder in 1 Timothy 3, 5. He said this, he says, But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the household of God? So for Paul, in his mind, if one doesn't manage their household well, it's, I guess, puts in question as to whether or not they're going to manage the church well. That's the reasoning he gives. Now, there's kind of a conundrum here in verse 13. Notice here it says, For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. First of all, I want you to understand here that there are two promises given to deacons, not because they are deacons, but because they are deacons who served well. So it's not just because someone attained the status of deacon that these two promises are given, but it's if they're deacons who have served well. Now, what are the promises? Well, notice there's two. The first is human-oriented, The second is God-oriented. The first promise is that they would have, and let me pull up my pointer to point to this, that they would have a high standing right here. Now, the term high in the Greek is kalos, literally a good standing. So more than likely, the idea is if they serve well as a deacon, they are going to have good standing and a reputation among their fellow brothers and sisters in the church, human-oriented. But the second promise, I think, certainly is God-oriented. And this is one that typically confuses people. Notice that they serve well as deacons. They also have great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Well, why would works give a person greater confidence with Jesus Christ in our relationship to him? I thought we were saved by faith alone, all by his grace alone. Well, we are. I want all of you to remember Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 that Bob taught us. Remember Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, for by grace we've been saved through faith. That not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So in verses 8 through 9 of Ephesians 2, we see that we're saved by faith alone, all by God's grace alone. But in verse 10, it does say we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So when a deacon serves well, their outward actions are evidence of the inward reality of their faith. I like to make the analogy of, think about your salvation being a car. What makes your car go? It's the engine, the engine of faith. But if the engine of faith is on and functioning, it must necessarily produce exhaust. Works are like exhaust. If you have a functioning engine, you have to produce exhaust. No exhaust, you don't have a functioning engine, you don't have saving faith. I think it's in that way the deacon's good works are evidence of their inward faith that they really do belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the idea that Paul is conveying. Okay, now with that, I have got a couple of application points for you here this morning. Number one, 
We should understand why deacons are necessary for the proper function of the church. I think too many times today, in today's church at large in America, pastors end up doing what deacons should be doing. And I'll be laying out that case. At the end of the day, elders and deacons serve. They just serve in different arenas. And I think it's important for the church at large to get back to a biblical model. So we'll show you why that is. Number two, we should know that service to other believers is essential to fulfilling the law of Christ. The deacons allow the church to be intentional about meeting the burdens of other brothers and sisters in the Lord. That's why deacons are so important. And bearing one another's burdens, as we'll find out, is a way that we keep the law of Christ. Okay, let's begin with this first one. In our culture, I think churches too often have taken pastors and put them in roles where deacons belong. When I was a Christian in the early 2000s, this is prior to me meeting Bob DeWay and going to seminary. I think I was still an airline pilot at the time. I went to a mega church, and this mega church, they had a pastor for everything. Pastor for care, pastor for kids, pastor for ice cream socials, pastor for this, pastor for that. There was pastors everywhere. Every third person you met was a pastor of something. Well, what I think that we're going to see is instead, deacons are called to many of these areas of service. At least that's how the Bible depicts it. Now, I'm going to show you next week when we get to 1 Timothy 3.14, Paul is going to say to us, I write these things to you so that you may know how to conduct yourselves in the church of God. So Paul, therefore, is saying that when he talks about the criteria for elders and deacons, he's talking about the way we as believers ought to conduct ourselves. So I think we should take this very seriously, how he models the church that is the Apostle Paul. Now, let's talk about this biblical model that deacons end up having to serve rather than just pastors. I think we see this develop in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, if you recall the context of this passage, you have two groups of Jews in Jerusalem. You have the Hellenized Jews and the natural-born Jews, as it were. Well, the natural-born Jews, their widows are being taken care of, but the Hellenized Jews, their widows are not receiving food, and so this becomes a crisis. Well, the apostles speak out. In fact, when it says in the very beginning here in Acts 6 2, the statement, this is, these are the 12 speaking. Okay, well, they're going to have in place men who function like deacons to remedy the situation. Listen to what they say. The 12 say, it is not desirable for us, notice the plural, to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, dear ones, notice here the apostles do not want to neglect the word to wait on tables. But I want you to consider this. It's not because waiting on tables is somehow beneath the apostle. That's not the issue. There is no task that is beneath some Christian and only fitting for another Christian. That is not the issue. The issue is one of time. Because human beings, including the apostles, are not omnipotent or omnipresent as God is, they can only do a certain amount of things. And so that's their concern. They do not want to neglect the word because of the time constraints by having to wait on tables. Now, very interestingly, notice here in verse 2, notice in red it says to serve tables. The term serve there is the verbal form of diakonos, deacon. That's what it is. So literally, they don't want to deacon tables. But notice down in verse 4, notice you have another adjectival form. Notice in ministry, that's also related to diakonos or deacon. So literally, you could think of it this way. The apostles are saying, we don't want to deacon tables. We want to deacon the word. That's what they're saying. So what they're saying is we don't want to serve in this way because we're constrained by time constraints to serve in this way. Again, 
What we see in this text is not that some tasks are beneath certain Christians and again only fitting for certain Christians. That's not the point. The point is that both waiting on tables is serving the flock and giving the word is serving the flock. So the flock must be served. The only question is who does what? That's the issue that is at hand. Now, what's interesting is some 25 years later, after Acts 6 happened, those events that we just read about, the Apostle Paul is in prison, and he writes a book like Philippians. And notice what he says in Philippians. Here we see the structure of elders and deacons. Philippians 1.1, Paul says, Paul and Timothy Bond servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. There's elders and deacons. Now, <clears throat> elders and deacons in a row where it happens just like you see in Philippians 1.1 1, 1, next to each other, this is the first time in the scriptures that they're placed next to one another. But undoubtedly, I think undoubtedly, those offices existed within the church from the very beginning. And that's what we see hinted at in Acts 6. Acts 6 probably occurs around 33, 34, 35 AD, very, very early on. Okay, so some 25 years later, you see this very developed discussion by Paul of the offices, overseer and deacons. Now, listen to Gordon Fee. Gordon Fee has a wonderful commentary, not just on 1 Corinthians but also in Philippians, and listen to what he says about this structure being with the church from the beginning. He says, quote, that there is little or no evidence for a hierarchy in the Pauline churches does not mean that leadership did not exist. It undoubtedly did. And there is no good reason to think that the titles given here, elders and deacons, and found again in 1 Timothy and Titus, did not exist from the beginning, unquote. So Gordon Fee, a wonderful scholar, very gifted, says, yes, these offices were more than likely with the church from the very beginning. That's what's being hinted at in Acts chapter 6. Now, some will say, well, wait a minute, in Acts chapter 6, Eric, you're taking a descriptive passage and you're making it a prescriptive passage. No, I'm not. Listen carefully. I don't think Luke's point in Acts chapter 6 is to give us a detailed discussion of how deacons came about. His point is to show you that the apostles wanted to keep preaching the word, but there are implications from the text because elsewhere in the scriptures we do see elders and deacons ordained. Think of this analogy when you think of Acts chapter 6. We often cite here at Gospel of Grace Acts 2.42. And for some of you that may be new, you may not know why, Acts 2.42, it talks about the means of grace. Remember the means of grace that the early church devoted themselves? There were four things. It was the assembling together. It was the Lord's Supper. It's the Word of God. And it's prayer. Now, Acts 2.42 is a descriptive passage of what the early church did. However, elsewhere in the New Testament, those things are prescribed for you and I. So, for example, when it comes to assembling together, remember Hebrews 10.25 says, do not forsake the assembling together as some are prone to do. So we see in Hebrews 10.25, it's immoral if you and I forsake the assembly. We see in 1 Corinthians 11.24 that Jesus commands us to do this in remembrance. That is, we're commanded to keep the Lord's Supper. Uh, Paul says in 2 Timothy 4.1, we are to preach the word in season and out of season. So we have to be dedicated to the word of God. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Paul says, pray without ceasing. So the four items in Acts 2.42 weren't just what the early church did. They're for all of us as well. The same thing in Acts chapter 6. Yes, it describes what the early church did, but it's prescribed that we would have elders who serve the word and deacons who serve the needs later on. That's what we see going on. In fact, turn your Bibles, if you will, to Titus 1.5. I want you to see that overseers are certainly commanded by Paul. Turn your Bibles to Titus 1.5. I want you to see that having elders in a church isn't an optional thing. It's something commanded by the Apostle Paul, who is an authoritative spokesman of Jesus Christ. Titus 1.5, 
Paul speaks this to Titus, who is what? A pastor, elder, and Crete. Paul says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Okay? So every church must have elders. It must. If you're a church, you have elders, at least two. That's what you have to have. So as the church grows, deacons become necessary. Why? Because the elders can no longer meet the needs of the people without neglecting the word of God. That's why deacons came about. That's what we see clearly, I think, here in the scriptures. So if you think about it, look on the screen, if you will. Overseers or elders. Remember, overseers are elders and elders are pastors. So there isn't a pastor who isn't an elder and there isn't an elder who isn't a pastor in the Bible. And what are they to do? They're to serve the word. Well, the deacon is also a servant. He's a servant, or she, of the needs of the saints. So, yes, there is going to be a service of the word, a service of the deeds of the saints, or the needs of the saints. Why? Because the saints must be served. The bottom line is the elders and the deacons are created by Christ so that the people of God will have their needs met. Primarily through the word, through the scriptures, with the elders, and primarily through the physical needs by the deacons. That's how God has ordained it. Now, let's go to that and say, well, why is this so important? Why is it so important to have deacons and elders meet the needs of the people? Well, that's because we are called as a body of Christ, as believers, to serve one another. We belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, who said that he did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And if you belong to him, you're called to service too. You and I are called to serve the wider world, but our service is always first and foremost focused on our fellow brothers and sisters. In fact, turn your Bibles to Galatians 6.10. I want you to see how central serving other brothers and sisters really is. Galatians 6.10. Please turn your Bibles there. Galatians 6.10, notice here what Paul says. He says, so then, while we have opportunity, he's talking about the church, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. So notice the calling for every believer is to serve everyone, to do good to everyone, but there's an emphasis on the household of the faith, other brothers and sisters. That's precisely what Jesus says in Matthew 25. One of the evidences that a believer belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ is the way they serve their fellow brothers and sisters. We see that in Matthew 25. By the way, this passage is part of the Olivet Discourse. So here in Matthew 25, Jesus is talking about his sheep on the right hand that enter into the kingdom. And remember, he has goats on his left. They don't enter into the kingdom. And what's interesting is Jesus explains his judgment. The way it works is those who serve brothers and sisters in Christ, that serves as evidence that they really believe they're the sheep who enter the kingdom. Those who don't serve the brothers and sisters of Christ, believers, that's evidence of those who perish. That's how important it is to serve the brothers and sisters. In fact, Jesus says here in Matthew 25, 40, he says, the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Now, notice that phrase, brothers of mine. That's very important. This text is often abused by the social gospel Marxists like Jim Wallace. Anybody ever heard of Jim Wallace in here? He's a Marxist. And he will take this passage and he'll say, Aha! We have to take from the haves and give to the have-nots. Let me pull up my pointer again. Notice the phrase, least of them. That's the have-nots for Jim Wallace, the Marxist. But notice he doesn't take note of the fact that Jesus is talking about the brothers of mine. Who are the brothers of Christ? They're believers. And the reason why they're the least of these isn't because they're the poorest financially. It's because the world has rejected them. If you belong to Jesus Christ, 
You no longer have status in the eyes of the world. That's the point of this text. But those who are willing to visit brothers and sisters in prison, who are willing to meet the needs of their brothers and sisters because they're ill, whether the brother or sister is with them or absent, if they're trying to meet the needs, they're actually serving Christ. Christ himself. Remember, in Acts chapter 9, Saul is on the road to Damascus. And do you remember how Jesus confronts him? Saul has been murdering Christians. You would expect Jesus to say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting them? But Jesus doesn't say that. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? To abuse the saints is to abuse Christ. To serve the saints is to serve Christ. That's why deacons are so critical in the structure of the church, because they are specifically designed so that the saints are served, that their needs are met, that their burdens are lifted. And this is exactly why we see Paul say also in Galatians 6 2, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Yes, this is something for every Christian to do. Every Christian is to help lift the burden of another brother or sister, but it is the deacon's responsibility to ensure that's happening. That's the significance of the deacon role. Now, why does bearing one another burdens fulfill the law of Christ? Well, every single one of us, no matter how old you are, no matter where you come from, at some point in your life, you're going to have a burden. And it's a beautiful thing that your brothers and sisters are there to help bear it. It's a beautiful thing that we are there to help bear one another's burdens. It's part of loving one another. And that's why Paul says if you bear one another's burdens, you're fulfilling the law of Christ. The law of Christ is a new law that he gives to his people. Remember, he's the lawgiver to love one another. Jesus said that very thing in John 13, 34 through 35. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Notice how many times Jesus refers to one another. That's why deacons are absolutely essential, because they help organize the body in such a way that the burdens of brothers and sisters are lifted, that we really do care and love for one another. I want to encourage this entire congregation. I've seen over the years you lift the burdens of many people in this congregation. You've lifted my burdens. You do serve one another. And I want to encourage you to keep doing so. I also want to thank our deacons here. We have Gene Fleecheck. Oh, if you wouldn't mind standing, Gene, I, ho- I hate to embarrass you. I, didn't wanna, I should have asked you all before this. We also have Peter Weam and Nancy Fleecheck. These, these three are standing right next to each other, if you wouldn't mind standing. Nancy, uh, she's going to sit. That's okay. She's there. Thank you for your service and what you do for Gospel of Grace Fellowship. We're so certainly grateful for the love and care that you've given all of us. And we pray that we would be those who would help you in ministering to all of the saints here at Gospel of Grace Fellowship. So with that, brothers and sisters, the deacons are absolutely necessary. Why? Because Jesus Christ served us, he called us to serve through the scriptures, the elders, and the deacons are to serve the needs of the saints. But the saints must be served if you belong to Jesus Christ, who first served us. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for your word, that you've given us clear instructions as to what elders and deacons are to be about and the criteria that we must hold to. And I do pray, Lord, for uh, godly men and women to raise up and want to become deacons and those who help lift the burdens of others. We thank you, Lord, for your word that you have clear criteria for us and that you also, Lord, love us and care for us enough to give us brothers and sisters who care deeply enough to be deacons and servants. We thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand, if you will, for the benediction. Jude 24 and 25, it says, Now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling 
and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful Sunday. I hope you get to dig out.